July 12, 2021. On a calm morning in Kelowna, engineers prepared for routine crane disassembly atop a 25-story tower. In seconds, the Liebherr 420EC-H16, a machine designed to lift over 16 tons, buckled and collapsed, killing five and destroying everything in its path. The official reports focused on tragedy, but beneath the wreckage, forensic teams found something more disturbing. Missing oversight, incomplete detachment, and a worker with just one hour of training. The title isn't a warning. These were the hidden errors behind the Kelowna crane tragedy in 22 minutes. But why did a textbook operation go so catastrophically wrong? The answer shatters industry assumptions and begins with a single overlooked step. Liebherr's 420 ECH-16 tower crane is engineered to lift 16 tons at close radius, a feat of precision and brute strength balanced by strict operating margins. Every component, mast, jib, slewing ring, relies on a delicate interplay of forces, all governed by a manual that leaves little room for improvisation. The disassembly sequence is not a matter of preference or habit. It is a four-step protocol refined through decades of hard lessons and written in manufacturer bulletins. First, unpin every connection with zero load. Then stabilize the section using braces or temporary supports. Next, verify detachment through both visual and mechanical checks with clear communication among the crew. Only then, on supervisor clearance, may the section be lifted. The load chart is absolute. At full extension, the crane's tip can support just over three tons, less than a quarter of its maximum at the base. The moment limit, 420 kilonewton meters, is a hard ceiling. Any deviation, an unexpected side load, a missed pin, a gust of wind, can erase the safety margin in seconds. During dismantling, the rules tighten further. Wind above 36 kilometers per hour means all work stops. Even brief peaks are enough to halt operations, a lesson reinforced by service bulletins after similar incidents in Europe. No section is ever to be lifted before full detachment. The manual repeats this in bold, with diagrams showing the risk. A locked pin under tension becomes a loaded fault line. The only hands allowed to supervise are those of a certified erector or professional engineer trained specifically on the model in use. Training is not a formality, Manufacturer guidance demands documented hands-on instruction and practical assessment. For the 420 ECH-16, a single hour of training would be considered not just insufficient, but dangerous. Industry standards echo these requirements. Every high-rise crane takedown must be planned in advance, with oversight from a licensed professional and a crew briefed on each step. The sequence is checked, double-checked, and signed off before any lift. In the absence of these controls, the risk is no longer theoretical. Technical literature and post-incident analyses are filled with examples where shortcuts, skipping stabilization, incomplete detachment, or lack of oversight have led to catastrophic failure. On July 12th, the Liebherr's strengths and its limits met at a single point, the expectation that every step would be followed, every margin respected. The machine's engineering could withstand heavy loads and sudden gusts, but not a skipped procedure. The difference between routine and disaster was measured not in tons or torque, but in the discipline to follow a sequence, one step at a time. At 10.45 a.m., the dismantling crew is positioned high above Bernard Avenue, working through the prescribed sequence. The mobile assist crane is already rigged to the mast. Hand signals are exchanged, some crew unpinning, others preparing for the next lift. In that moment, a load is taken on a mast section before every pin is clear. The steel connection, designed to bear weight only when fully detached and stabilized, is now absorbing a force it was never meant to hold. A sharp metallic crack splits the air. Witnesses on nearby rooftops later describe a jolt, then a shutter running up the tower. CCTV footage, timestamped to the second, captures the first unnatural tilt of the horizontal jib. Five seconds in, the upper assembly begins to yaw. The main mast, deprived of its engineered support, flexes at the climbing frame. On the ground, workers shout and scatter. The mobile crane's boom, still tethered to the upper section, pulls sideways as the structure gives way. The failed connection shears clean, a brittle, almost surgical break, consistent with sudden loaded tension on a locked pin. Forensic laser scans, 
referenced in sealed reports, later confirmed the absence of progressive cracking or fatigue. This is a single catastrophic overload. By the sixth second, the entire top of the crane, jib, counter jib, cab, pivots and accelerates downwards. The vertical mast, no longer balanced, topples in a chain reaction. Sight videos from helmet cams and bystanders show the collapse gathering speed, metal folding in on itself as gravity takes over. At 11 seconds, the falling mast strikes the adjacent office building, then the senior's residence. The dust cloud billows outward, obscuring the wreckage. Power lines snap. The city block is plunged into chaos. 15 seconds after the first pin gives way, the site is silent except for alarms and distant sirens. The collapse is complete. No wind gusts, no visible buckling, no electronic distraction. Just a sequence cut short, a procedure skipped, and a margin erased by human hands. The evidence left behind, a sheared pin, a twisted mast, and a timeline measured in seconds, will become the foundation for every investigation that follows. Fire crews arrive to a scene that defies routine. Steel and concrete block every approach, the air thick with dust and the smell of diesel. The command post is set up on Bernard Avenue, but the collapsed site remains unstable. Secondary failure is a constant threat. Urban search and rescue teams deploy specialized drones overhead, mapping the debris field in real time. High-angle rescue technicians work in harnesses, scanning for voids where survivors might be trapped. Thermal imaging cameras sweep the wreckage, searching for signs of life or heat signatures beneath twisted metal. The first 48 hours are critical. Every movement must be calculated. Power lines dangle across the site, and the risk of a further collapse hangs over every decision. Crews use remote-controlled cutters to slice through mangled beams. No one enters the danger zone unless absolutely necessary. Portable spotlights turn night to day as teams rotate through shifts, pausing only for brief updates and to check structural monitors. Fire department logs record every step. Search teams locate the first victim within hours, but progress slows as rescue workers encounter compacted debris and pockets of chemical fumes. The odor of burning rubber mixes with hydraulic fluid. At one point, a creak from the remaining mast halts all operations. Engineers reassess, then give the cautious go-ahead. Recovery is methodical, exhausting. Crews work in silence except for radio calls and the whine of power tools. Each body is located with the help of thermal cameras and careful probing, then extricated under the watch of technical specialists. For many responders, the experience leaves a mark. Several later report nightmares, anxiety, and difficulty returning to routine calls. By the end of the second day, the last victim is recovered. The rescue operation draws praise for its precision, but the emotional toll is clear. The scale of destruction, the effort to prevent further tragedy, and the knowledge that every minute counted. These details will linger long after the site is cleared. Eric Stemmer and his brother Patrick grew up on construction sites, learning the trade from their father before they could drive. Both had families of their own. Both were known for working long hours and rarely missing a shift. On July 12th, their names appeared together on the fatality list. The Stemmer family lost two sons in a single morning. At the memorial, their father described the pain as a hole that can't be filled. Jared Zook, 32, had just bought a house with his partner. He was saving for a wedding, planning a life that would never happen. Friends remember him as the one who always volunteered for the hardest jobs, the first to arrive and the last to leave. His family established a safety foundation in his name, believing that no one else should have to get a call like theirs. Kalen Vilnis was the youngest, 23 years old, eager to prove himself, he joined this crew with only an hour of formal crane disassembly training. His mother, Danielle Pritchett, speaks about the pride he felt working on a project that changed the city skyline. She also describes the frustration of unanswered questions, no access to the full investigation, no closure, just a gaping wound. For months, she wrote letters to regulators asking how a novice ended up in such a dangerous role. There were no answers, only condolences. Brad Zawislak was not part of the construction team. He worked in a neighboring office, killed instantly when the mast struck his building. His wife and children attended every public hearing, sitting quietly in the back row. The compensation process dragged on for years, tangled in insurance disputes and legal filings. 
For the Zawislaks, the collapse was not just an accident, but the start of a long, uncertain fight for recognition. Levi Sampson survived, but not unchanged. He lost part of his leg in the collapse. Post-traumatic stress keeps him awake most nights, replaying the sound of steel breaking and the scramble to escape. WorkSafe BC reduced his compensation to $17 an hour, barely enough to cover rent. He speaks rarely, but when he does, it is with a single request. Remember what happened here. Every July, families gather at the corner of Bernard Avenue to lay flowers beneath a silhouette sculpture of a crane. They read the names aloud. For them, the collapse is not an abstract lesson or a line in a safety manual. It is a daily absence, a reminder that rules exist for a reason. Behind every number in the report, there is a story unfinished, a family still waiting for answers. Online forums and news comment sections filled quickly with theories. Some blamed a sudden wind gust, others whispered about a distracted operator checking Instagram, and a few pointed to possible hidden flaws in the steel itself. But official weather logs from Environment Canada show no wind event on July 12th. Conditions stayed below 20 kilometers per hour all morning. The Liebherr's manual sets the wind limit for dismantling at 36, far above anything recorded that day. Forensic engineers working under the RCMP and WorkSafe BC pulled device logs and phone records from every crew member involved. No evidence surfaced of anyone using a phone, tablet, or camera at the moment of collapse. The records, sealed for the criminal investigation, show nothing unusual. No call, no text, no app usage in the minutes before disaster. The operator's hands were accounted for in every witness statement and technical debrief. Metallurgical lab tests on the failed mast and sheared pin tell the same story. The break was clean, sudden, and consistent with a locked connection loaded under tension. No sign of slow-growing cracks, no corrosion, no manufacturing defect in the steel. Litigation filings from both sides reference these findings, but neither the manufacturer nor the contractor can point to a flaw in the metal itself. The catastrophic overload matches only one scenario. A section lifted before every pin was free. Industry experts reviewing the collapse sequence agree. The crane did not buckle from its own weight, nor did a hidden weakness give way. The timeline, reconstructed from helmet cam footage and eyewitness clocks, shows a rapid all-at-once failure, 15 seconds from first tilt to total collapse. The evidence points back to a skipped procedure, not a hidden flaw. Theories about wind, distraction, or defective steel remain just that, rumors unsupported by any official record or technical report. The RCMP's criminal investigation wrapped up in early 2024. Duo 2024, nearly three years after the collapse, detectives recommended charges of criminal negligence causing death. But as of September 2025, not a single charge has been filed. The full case file, thousands of pages of forensic data, witness interviews, and technical analysis remains under seal at the request of the BC Prosecution Service. No company or individual has been named publicly. Families left waiting for answers have seen only redacted summaries. WorkSafe BC completed its own technical probe in 2023, but the final report is also locked away. Regulators cite the risk of prejudicing any future trial. For those who lost loved ones, this secrecy is a second wound. IUOE Local 115. The International Union of Operating Engineers has been the most vocal advocate for change. In a letter to the Premier, they called the Kelowna collapse a lesson written in blood, demanding mandatory oversight by certified crane erectors for every dismantling operation in the province. The union points to four more crane incidents in British Columbia since 2021, each involving procedural shortcuts or missing supervision, each avoidable. We can't learn and prevent future tragedies with hidden reports, they warn. Their call is echoed by families, safety advocates, and many in the industry, all asking, how many more must die before the rules catch up to the risks? Legislative proposals now circulate in Victoria. Public registries for crane operations, stricter certification, open reporting of near misses and failures. But without the release of the Kelowna findings, reforms move slowly. The lessons of July 12th remain locked behind legal walls. 
In the meantime, every construction professional in Canada is left to weigh the cost of silence. The union's message is blunt. Change will not come from government alone. It will come from workers, engineers, and supervisors who refuse to accept shortcuts, who demand that every rule is followed, every margin respected. The next disaster is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. On July 12th, 2021, five lives were lost in just 15 seconds when the Liebherr 420EC-H16 crane collapsed during disassembly in downtown Kelowna. Forensic documents show the collapse was triggered by lifting crane sections before all pins were fully detached, a clear violation of the manufacturer's four-step procedure. WorkSafe BC records confirm that one victim, Kalen Vilnis, had received only one hour of training. MP and WorkSafe, BC investigations remain ongoing, with the final incident report still sealed as of September 2025 and no criminal charges filed to date. While rumors of wind, distraction, or metal fatigue have been disproven, the exact chain of decision-making in those final minutes remains classified. In response, union leaders and industry groups have pushed for mandatory oversight and stricter training across Canada. The Kelowna tragedy stands as evidence that safety rules exist for a reason, and when ignored, consequences are immediate and irreversible.